My name is Kate Stewart, um, and I've been focusing on Zephyr pretty much since the project started. And what we'll be doing today is sort of going through our journey towards security, quite frankly, um, and what we've been trying to do in adopting best practices in the project. So um, I'd like this to be interactive, so feel free to ask questions. Um, for those who are sort of new to Zephyr, it is an open source uh, real-time project. And when I say we built it with safety and security in mind, literally before we even launched the project, we actually made sure we had changes in the governance. And then we've been trying to live up to what we've been working on all the way along. It is vendor neutral, um, and it is an open project. And we have been taking a lot of lessons from Linux, quite frankly because we saw things that worked and we made sure we could adopt them into Zephyr. And as a result of that, we're now seeing lots of really interesting products emerge in the marketplace that are running Zephyr today. Um, last, in August, we found, a link, we got pointed to links to the um, spec sheets for the Galaxy Ring from Samsung and in the Korean specs, they had mentions of Zephyr and the ones in North America, they didn't. So it's a lovely detective game to find products that actually are using this embedded open source right now. Um, we also learned that um, here, it's actually now in space. We've actually got Zephyr now in space on a satellite. It's not being used to mission critical. It's being used in the payloads. But what it does is it is doing the same sorts of things it's doing on servers, um, where it is monitoring for certain environmental conditions or certain events to happen, and then it brings up the Linux on the FPGA for some of the processing. So it's being used in conjunction with Linux to make it a more efficient system overall. Um, it's in all Google Chromebooks right now. Again, when Chromebook is powered down or the lid is shut, Linux, um, Zephyr is running so it doesn't consume a lot of power on MCUs. And then you're seeing it from you know, the various ones I was talking about yesterday as well as um, things like hearing aids. Because you want your battery to last um, on your hearing aid when your battery is talking initially to like your cell phone with Bluetooth, so you're getting good signal coming in. Um, that is usually, usually is using Zephyr and they're adding more functionality to it from my discussions with the folks at Oticon. Um, but you want your battery on your hearing aid to last a full day. So when power is important, that's when they're sort of looking at what we do with the Zephyr. You know, Zephyr. And we see it, you know, it's things like wind turbines. So there's over 700 boards in the repo at this point now. And it continues to grow pretty much every week. Uh, the 4.0 release, we just, uh, we just basically um, did the freeze. And so we're on the countdown now to putting the first 4.0 milestone out. And then in about two and a half years, we'll put the next LTS. But each release, we're basically catching more and more boards. And there's over 220 sensors in the repo. And so it's growing pretty fast in this area too. In fact, uh, when I was looking at the stats, um, we pretty much doubled the number of sensors in two years. So people are getting things that are close and then just extending and adding beyond that. Okay? And as you can sort of see, the architecture is pretty complete at this point in time. Most of the connectivity stacks are there. Um, we have all the regular things you'd expect from a kernel, as well as various interfaces into the hardware. And obviously, all the main architectures are supported at this point now. Uh, 32 and 64-bit versions, and so you have cases where like an A-core might be there, 64-bit uh, A-core, and then maybe a Zephyr port for it. Usually it's being used with Linux, but some people may want to have you know, different scenarios. So some of these ports are actually sitting in the repo already, and there's no, nothing to stop you from doing it. And so the ecosystem is slowly and slowly growing more vibrant as we've gone along. And one of the things that was kind of fun is, <laughs> you see that um, this is from the start of July, these are measured by CNCF. I didn't measure them, okay? <laughs> I'm not doing it, it's not a Zephyr thing. However, if you actually look, Zephyr is now the fourth most active project at the Linux Foundation by velocity. So this is a logarithmic scale, okay? Of, you know, commits and pull requests and it's sort of showing community interaction. And one of the things, if you actually go to this report that's down here, there's another table. And that other table lists the top 30 open source projects in the entire ecosystem. Not just LF, but all of them. And um, Zephyr's now number 28. So we're hitting the top 30 list finally, which is kind of exciting from my perspective. So what does it actually look like you know, day to day? Um, this, you can sort of see this. I took this last week. I just figured, OK, let's see what it's looking like. Um, 
and so we've had about 300 plus people in the last month um, putting in pull requests. And there's been over 2,000 pull requests that have gone into the repo. And then, as you can sort of see, that there's been you know sometimes more contributors in the last month than some of these other ones have had in their entire lifetime. Okay. So it's a really good, vibrant community at this point. And this data is just coming um, from GitHub, OK? You know, I could argue that, oh, we should, we're, not catch, we're not counting our SDKs and all the other things. I just took the straight repos, OK? And I think the trend line's pretty clear. But what's interesting is that now we're now about 2.8 commits per hour into Zephyr. The kernel's about nine commits an hour. So we've been slowly and surely inching our commits per hour upwards. <laughs> And the repos are, are structured this way. Um, with that range of velocity, it's all happening here in the development branch, OK? And then the long-term stable, we're seeing like one or two commits each month, which is the type of velocity we can work with with the product. So what we're basically, you know, develop upstream first, lesson from Linux, and then um, for people making products, as long as it's got the features you want, you'll get the community supporting you with security fixes. So base your stuff off of that. And if we were adding more stuff and traceability and things like that, which will be eventually for the auto deployment. <coughs> so these are our repos, and I use those terms throughout this talk. And if you've got questions, just ask. But the last, you know, this summer we put out the LTS. And so we'll be supporting this for two and a half years with the security updates. And we've got some things queued up for it. We're trying, to, we're trying to basically get into the cadence of putting a release, an update to our um, LTS at least every quarter. If there's a really urgent issue, we'll be putting things out. But we want to try and make sure we get into more regular cadence. It's one of the things that the TSC decided to work on. However, we got to this, space, <laughs> we got to this place in time because we actually did focus on security from the start. So this is a page right from our governance documents for the project. And we wanted to be, deliver our best-in-class RTOS. And so here's the latest update of it. But literally, this is a document that was created in 2015. And um, right inside there, we talk about our security committee. And that's been there right from the start. So the project has taken this seriously. And we've been trying to use it, Zephyr as a way of, can we do this right? And so one of the things that was kind of interesting for us is just shortly after we launched Zephyr, um, we actually had our very first security meeting literally the same week we launched the project. And we did it at, at, in Nuremberg at Embedded World. And we actually had the people meeting for the security committee for the first time. But about three or four months after that, there was the CII best practices badge. How many people remember the OpenSSL issues back in 2015? OK, one, hand, one or two hands. So um, actually, it was 2014, but they. Um, one of, the result, one of the responses to this was to form this group of people trying to study to figure out and improve security practices. And they came up with, um, David Wheeler and some of the others came up with a, effectively, here's the, what a project to do for best practices. And we basically, it came out about the same time as Zephyr was coming out, so went, the security committee went, OK, let's go see what it's like. And so, um, you know, it can be applied to any open source project. I'm curious, how many pe people here have, are working on open source projects that actually have been badged? with passing one, two. OK. Um, I would encourage you, if you have an open source project, to go look at it and look at the criteria and see if you can apply it to your criteria. Because it's just good hygiene, OK? It really isn't that dramatic, especially just to get passing. But um, it's now in under OpenSSF. And um, a lot of the key projects are out there. And so the criteria itself is three. There's three levels. Um, you know, you have to, to get. From passing, you have to, you know, to get to gold, you have to have been silver. To get from silver, you had to be passing. Um, and starting off getting passing is a good thing. Um, some of the gold criteria require you to have more than one person in the project. But even still, up to that point, these things are available. And it's not the newest thing on the block right now, but it is something that I think a lot of the projects should just go through and drew. Because I think it's actually, it'll, it makes things more visible. And we, we found it really valuable in Zephyr. And so this is some of the, the criteria from it. And there's not a lot of gold criteria, but each, each level has criteria. And um, you know, if you disagree with it, you can <coughs> push back and uh, you know, have a discussion about that. But we launched Zephyr. 
in February of 2016. As I said, the CI Badge project launched in um, three months later. So we went, okay, let's see what happens. And in six months after it launched, we got passing. Okay, not that hard. Because, you know, we're doing it every two, like, you know, we're meeting every couple weeks and, you know, talking through and then putting things upstream and cleaning things up. And, you know, as part of that, we cleaned up our security documentation. So there is, you know, we had to document what our base, you know, what the overview was, what our criteria was. And these are the things that we're being last for. <laughs> But then, and this is where I started to become a believer in using this, is we suddenly stopped passing. Okay, well, what happened in 2017? Well, what happened in 2017 is we changed our infrastructure. We went from Jira to GitHub issues and Garrett to GitHub. And it was automatically checking these links in, our rec in the repo of our criteria for the things we'd submitted. So all of a sudden we stopped passing, which made me think, oh, okay, let's take it seriously. So we basically... Um, cleaned up our act and got everything in there and you know as a committee we sort of talked about trying this and decided to try for the silver because the silver one had rolled up by that point and so we started moving in that direction and we started looking at well maybe we should just become a CVE numbering authority or CNA and that would less manage our vulnerabilities and so at the time there really wasn't many projects open source projects um, that were being their own CNAs and um, so we started investigating. What, it, what it, the program has evolved a lot since the days we were starting. Um, there's a lot more onboarding stuff and things like that now. But we, you know, we, we got on calls and we talked to people at MITRE and so forth. And we had to create some mailing lists. And then, effectively, once we decided uh, we were going to try for it, we had to have our scope defined. We had to have a public point of contact, a direct point of contact. I.e., someone will definitely respond if no one does to the public one, and some email lists. And so we did that as a project, and we've kept it going ever since. Okay? There's volunteers that manage this, and they are on the security committee, and then they also volunteer to keep an eye on this type of thing. And so at that point, then, we got announced as a CVE numbering authority. Mostly at that point when we did this, it was mostly corporations, it wasn't open source projects. Now, to put this into context, the Linux project became a CVE numbering authority just this year. And we were doing this with Zephyr back in 2017. So, like I say, we were taking security very seriously. And it's not that Linux doesn't take security seriously. It's just, you know, we, we tried to work within the system here. And this is what we look like today if you go look at it. And, you know, and so you see, it just basically says how to get in touch and what sort of the policies are. And so... You know, our security architect, which is an elected position, is leading this. And it's volunteers from the committee that do the triage. And then they work with the maintainers under embargo to get things fixed. And then, quite frankly, things get put in the upstream. And then we manage the embargo window so that we can notify people who have products and get things fixed. So we started that off. And we went, OK, let's go to Silver and, you know, Kept going, kept going in 2018, 2019, you know, and we fun hit, we, we hit it in 2018, we got a silver, yay. And then we got it, four months later, we had to write an application, I think, <laughs> because the criteria expects applications rather than operating systems. Um, and then, so 2019, we got our gold badge. So we're feeling pretty smug at this point, okay? Yay, we're doing good security stuff, all good. Then we got our first bulk vulnerability report. Someone had contracted with um, the NCC group um, I still don't know who, uh, to do an assessment of Zephyr. And they came to us and said, C you know, here's CNA group, you know, here PCR team, we found 26 issues. And we go like, uh-huh, okay, guess we still have some work to do. Um, so we actually worked with them and we got everything addressed and um, we have everything under embargo, we managed things and we had some lessons, we learned things from it. And so, you know, um, you can actually look at their um, report. They were quite happy with working with us. And they basically said most things were fixed in a reasonable time. Um, we just did some disabling. And we adjusted our policies because of this, because we recognized that, okay, we took our window from 60 days to 90 days, so we could have 30 days up front for us to fix it, and then let people who are doing products with us have the 60 days, so that they could work with their downstreams and their clients. And so we're continuing to improve the process is pretty much what it's coming down to. 
Um, we added a vulnerability reporting mechanism into the project. Um, so the information is all documented. Um, there's a security section on the main page of our website. And, um, you know, we basically wanted to make sure that um, we were improving our communication outside. So first thing is put the process in place and then make sure people understand what your process is. And so product makers and support for product makers is, um, you know, one of the factors here. And realistically, if you have a product and you're using Zephyr, um, you can register for free to be notified. But you have to prove to us you actually have a product because we don't bad actors here. So um, if you do have a product and you, know, you can point us to it and things like that and everything is coherent, we'll just add you in so that you can be notified about vulnerabilities. So we're trying to take seri you know, security seriously here. And then there's been a lot of things about S-bombs and VEX and that stuff in the industry. And we had an interesting lesson um, back in 2020. How many here remember Amnesia 33? No, okay. It was a problem with the FNet uh, stack in embedded, and a lot of the RTOSs out there were using it, especially a lot of the commercial ones. Um, and if you had looked at Zephyr as is, our current 2.4, like our current release at the time, 2.4, wasn't using it, but our LTS at that time, which was 1.0x, did have some FNet code in it. And so you might have thought, oh, we, our LTS was vulnerable here. Well, actually, it wasn't, because we had to actually look. And we, if we look down at the function levels, at, you know, quite frankly, at the file levels, for that matter, none of the code that was, had the vulnerabilities was actually in Zephyr. The FNet version was there, but the code wasn't there, which pretty much said, okay, how do we tell people this? Well, <laughs> we put a blog out. That was the only way we could tell people. Nowadays, we can do things like issuing vexes and things like that, and that's where things are heading. But um, it drove home a lesson of you have to pay attention to the source file levels at the file level, like the functions and what's actually there to really know if you're vulnerable with a security issue. And so you want to get rid of the false positives. And so this influenced some thinking for us. And this also, that influencing the thinking led us when we were doing the SBOM and putting, automatically putting an SBOM generation in 21 to make sure that we could be very articulate about exactly which source files were there and then link from the source files to the .os, .os to the .as, and .as to the alpha image. So you'll find this um, video up um, on YouTube when we first put SBOM work into Zephyr back then. So it's been there and we've been refining it and honing it since then. And in fact, to generate an SBOM, and Zephyr is pretty straightforward. You basically, you do your init with SPDX, do your build, and you have it. You've got three commands, and you've got your SBOMs if you're using Zephyr. And you get um, a source, an SBOM of the Zephyr sources, oops, sorry, of the sources that from the Zephyr repo, an SBOM for any app sources, and then you get a build SBOM. And that is where the magic's happening, which is saying exactly what dot O's, what C files and are made into dot O's, and which dot O's are into the dot A's, and which dot A's are into your alpha image. So you can be very precise as, are you potentially affected by a vulnerability or not, and get rid of a whole class of those false positives, which are just looking and relying on component versions. And if you want to see this at scale, this dashboard is freely available um, from Renode. They're a simulator company. And they go through the entire um, device tree manifest in Zephyr and all the boards. And they basically have about 815 targets when I looked at it this morning. And there's 13 apps across, and they build everything. Okay? And then they run them on their simulator as part of the testing, their simulator. But anything that is running, if you mouse over to this third over from the bottom, it says download S bombs. So we basically have. You know, about 8,000 you know, 8, times 3, so 2,400 S-bombs sitting there, files sitting underneath there that have been built in. And so you can do this at scale because it's just those three commands, right? So it becomes very easy to actually take and operationalize this, which is one of the things I think that's missing in the industry, and then be precise. You could, you know, there's things you can do to take it to the component level, get other things going, look for scales, but being precise is what we're going to need eventually for safety. And so by having this here already, it, it puts us in pretty good space. And so this is what it kind of looks like in reality with the 2.3, um, actually I think it was the 2.2 version. No, it's 
And so you basically are linking this type, this statement basically sets up a symbolic link to this one. This set, statement sets up a symbolic link to this one, and then you're referencing them, document ref Zephyr. Um, here's your C file. And you've got everything hashed, so you have the entrance, to, you, know, you have um, the ability to be explicit that something has been tampered with. And so that's what it's looking like, and it's there. So what is happening on the vulnerability infrastructure side? Um, well, we transitioned over to GitHub in 21, as you see. And we've had about 68 um, CVs published since then. Um, and we, you know, the private repos became available for projects. That's the reason we went over there. Um, we were doing other systems before that. And it makes it easier for the developers to just keep things seamlessly working. And then we've been doing some classification of our CWEs and seeing from those CVs what's actually been happening and where are the weakness areas. And looking at, okay, what parts of the code are we seeing these problems in and what type of, you know, what sort of issues. And realistically, you know, the critical and, you know, the high, the support, the critical is only about 4%, high is where they were seeing things, but even still. Uh, for us, um, our Bluetooth stack is leading edge, usually, because we work with the Bluetooth SIG and so we're referencing some of the code that gets for the new standards is going in there, and that's probably the, that's the largest source of our issues, is because it's coming in from a bleeding edge standard. Um, there's some issues that have been detected in the networking, and then others. But you know, at this point in time, and this is you know over the entire lifetime of the project, so we, we're able to look at this type of thing and you know keep focus on where we need to do it. Um, one of the challenges for us as a community is it was just a. a it was just, the committee was just composed of members for security. And we wanted to start looking at other things. Um, and so we created a security working group that's open to anyone in the community to come join us. Anyone can come in and sit in. It happens, meets every two weeks. And the focus of this group is, okay, what are we going to do for standards? And how are we going to start to do some of the assessments? And if people want to do things in a public way and reviewing, this is the place to do things. And then this one here is the security committee for the members, and we sort of keep it to the members because of some of the vulnerability and PCR discussions that are going on. So that's kind of what's happening, and there's work going on uh, for achieving the Etsy uh, 303645 standard right now, um, and it's all been publicly documented. And so you can sort of see the assessments go on, and we work from, from that perspective. And so if you see anything there and you disagree with it, open an issue, or even better, pull requests, like every open source project. Um, so we got to the stage uh, last year. We met, the security committee managed to convince the governing board to allocate some funding for us. Let's, see, let's go back to NCC group and see if they can find what they're finding. Have, we, have, you know, have things you know, slacked off over the time period and things like that? And um, we did an external audit. And as a result, you know, okay, um, they took our, we, we were coming up on an LTS. We wanted to make sure that it was as crisp as it could be because we had to li live with it for a while. And they found two low severity issues and uh, one informational. So at this point in time, we were looking in a reasonable shape. And so it was sort of like, that was a lot of money to know that we didn't have an issue, but okay, fine, that's good to know. All right, and those have been fixed, the low ones were fixed. So. It was a good exercise for the, pro the team in the sense that it talked us, ta taught us about defining the scope of an audit and doing some future proofing and updating some of our threat modeling was, used, came out of this as well. Um, we did have confidence from the, the positive results we saw. And um, you know, we basically put in some recommendations for some improving some things as a project. So we're, we're continuing to work on this stuff. Um, if, you want, if you're curious about this, um, Flavio, who's our architect, and David Brown, who's the chair of the committees, um, did a talk um, earlier this year, and it's freely available. And so if you want to listen to them firsthand rather than me, they can talk about some of the stuff you're seeing here in detail. And, and they did review my slides and approve them before I, could, I was going to talk about them. <laughs> but I think the net takeaway here is best practices take time. It's not going to suddenly happen like that. You have to basically commit to it with the mindset, and then, quite frankly, be consistent. Okay, and if you do that, you can. You know, projects can do this. Um, you know, we had, you know, we documented our practices initially. We we're being transparent. We went in as a CV and numbering a third. We got that gold badge. I think we were the fifth to get it. Actually, I was quite pleased. I think Tough was close. Yeah. yeah okay. 
you were six around, you were around the same time we were. I still remember that. Um, and then, you know, we improved our vulnerability management process. We added the SBOM generation. We've been, you know, getting more infrastructure with GitHub for the automation. And then improving the transparency of the community, working on the self attestation of this, and then, you know, working on security audits. So it's a journey, and we'll continue to evolve. Um, with security, you know, there's always new things coming down. People are being more creative. How do we build up from that? Um, you know, we've got new APIs happening with the vulnerability data disclosures. Um, we've got to adopt and work with that. Um, we are doing more and more with our regression infrastructure. Um, and so we've got a coding guidelines that the project has um, agreed to. They're loosely based off, well, they're mostly based off of MISR with some variants. And we're working on getting tooling to automatically be checking everything and keeping things up to date. Um, and we do the covariety like most people, projects do. And then, you know, we work with educating new maintainers on how to work with us, as well as, you know, our volunteers have different levels of background. So, you know, making things prop bite sized and building up the next generation of people who can deal with security is, you know, one of the functions. So with that, that's pretty much all I've got about what we're doing on our Zephyr security story. If anyone is interested in learning more, um, you know, happy to have any questions right now, or and happy to, um, you know, talk further. Any questions? Go for it. Okay. Anyway, but my, my actual question is, um, uh -huh. at what stage did you do threat modeling, and at what stage would you recommend other people do threat modeling? Um, after you document your processes, we sort of did threat modeling right after that. We actually created our first threat model for the project um, probably within the first year. Okay. Um, and then we've continued to refine it. We always need to keep refining it, it seems like. Um, and I think getting into the discipline of understanding what your, your threat boundaries are and so forth is a very useful exercise for any project. I have a question about the uh, CNA program and your experience yeah. with it. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the criticisms for a CNA program sometimes, you know, you get too many frivolous CVEs, people trying yep. to uh, find CVEs, and have you kind of used any of the CNA programs, escalation mechanisms to root CNA, or have you managed to kind of We've okay actually, with? like I say, we don't, up till now anyhow, we have not been seeing, um, we've sort of seen maybe one or two a month, which is quite manageable by both the volunteer side of it. Um, and the fact that we are a CVE numbering authority means that other people aren't asserting things. So if someone's asserting this an issue, we get to have the say. And so if someone wants to escalate us, but no one's escalated us yet. So it keeps things much more tractable um, from the project's perspective to have the ability to say, yeah, we know the code best. We know what's going on here. Um, I think that was part of the reason that Greg decided to finally work with Linux that way too. Any other questions? Well, I will say thank you very much then for um, your interest in the project and happy to you know, talk further. And then if you're interested in learning more, um, we'll be having a BOF um, uh, at the end of the afternoon. The last session today will be a Zephyr BOF too. And I will have kites at that BOF. So if anyone wants a Zephyr kite, please come join us. Thank you.